So good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the post-lunch transport session at the Smart Cities Exhibition and Conference. Um, I realize that we're running quite late, so if you'll excuse me, I will uh, dispense with some of the formalities. Um, so we won't do, uh, do speaker introductions. Um, I would uh, request all the speakers to uh, start off individually, uh, one by one, with um, a small brief on what it is that they want to say. Um, yeah, that's right. So uh, Dr. Ashok uh, Junjunwala, who is the principal advisor for the Ministry of Railways, uh, Government of India, is the keynote uh, speaker. So uh, Dr. Junjunwala will give his keynote address, and then uh, he'll uh, have to leave us, so he won't join us for a Q&A afterwards. Uh, and since we're running late, we'll uh, start immediately. So uh, Dr. Junjunwala, if you would, please. Thank you. So while we wait for... So while we wait for Mr. Junjunwala's uh, presentation to be loaded, I'll just take the time to uh, introduce the other panelists. Uh, Mr. Alan Tom Abraham is an analyst at uh, Bloomberg New Energy Finance. Uh, Mr. Girish Kamala is director and country head automotive at Infineon Technologies. Um, Mr. Manoj Karwa is w vice president Clean Wave Technologies. Mr. Awadish Kumar Jha is vice president at Fortum India. Uh, Mr. Sudeep Mukherjee Sriram, uh, uh, sorry, is uh, from Sriram Auto Mall. Uh, Dr. Paritosh Nandi is Director Envert E-Vehicles. And Mr. Abhishek Raj Ranjan is AVP, System Operation and Head Renewables and DSM Initiatives at BSES. Dr. Junjula, over to you. Is my mic on or can you hear me? Is the mic on? Can you hear me? Okay, I'm Professor Junjunwala, uh, Professor from IIT Madras. I have been here in Delhi for last year and a half as a principal advisor to Sri Piyush Goel. Earlier, while he was at energy and power, and now with railways and now with finance. So, uh, one of the things that I've been driving is electric vehicle, and the question that was posed to me is that India has very limited subsidy, and the affordability is also very low. Can we really make EV scale? And my presentation will be, how does one make EV scale in this kind of situation? About a year back, the mood, about a, or 14, 15 months back, the mood was very dismal in the industry. They say, oh, we don't have charging stations. We have to go to the hybrid road, 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 road. Um, there is 30 to 40 percent subsidy world over in electric vehicle. India doesn't have that kind of subsidy and we will not go anywhere. Mood has completely changed with about 50 Indian companies. I don't think many of them are here. Most of them are here, are going hammer and tongs on EV. The vehicle companies, I have listed the name. Those of you want, I can send you this presentation if the organizers themselves cannot give you the presentation. Um, Ashok Leland, Tara Motors, Mahindra, Aishar, Bajaj, lithium ion battery, Manufacturing and recycling, whether it's energy operators, chargers and motors, there are a large number of co companies which are going hammer and tongs to go ahead and launch the whole thing in a very, very big manner. Now, what, what has changed? First thing has been there is a recognition that EV is going to happen, whether we like it or not. There are good reasons EV will happen. And if we don't do it, it will be all imported. It will hit our GDP. It will hit our jobs. The second important thing that was recognized that it has a very low affordability. India is the one of the very, very few places where there is a four lakh rupee car is extremely popular. And then there are three wheelers and two wheelers. And in United States, Europe, and China, there is a subsidy between 30 to 40 percent. And in India, it was sort of said either zero subsidy or very limited subsidy. Particularly, the current finance minister is totally against subsidy. How do you make EV make business sense and scale? This was the challenge that were posed to us. Most of the industry did not believe that. Of course, one of the things that was helping us is that the battery prices were falling very rapidly, fallen to about seven, eight times over the last three to four years. And yet, the cost was too high of the electric vehicle, and therefore, something more was needed. What is that something more, and how do we go about driving things innovatively. If you copy whatever is being done in Denmark and try to bring it out here, 
it makes no business sense. Somebody has to provide subsidy. How do we really go about doing it differently? That was the key challenge. And I remember the, much of the discussion started in a meeting. First important thing is affordability, most you know. Most of our vehicles are two-wheelers. Our three-wheelers have become the primary mode of public transport, even more than the buses. For the middle and the lower middle classes, all transport between villages to towns take place on three-wheelers, large three-wheelers, shared three-wheelers. And within cities also, three-wheelers are playing extremely important role. What about the cars? The total number of cars in India are less than 13%. But what is more important, that almost 85% almost of them are below 10 lakhs rupees. If you take car above 10 lakhs rupees, hmm, then the total number of cars as a percentage of vehicle population will be less than 2%. Now what is interesting is that if you go to Europe, go to China, go to the United States, the electrification that they are talking about is those vehicles which cost 30,000, 40,000, 25,000 dollars, all the charging standards, etc., are all being defined for that. And very often we just talk about, oh, we'll bring them out here. But what do you do for 2% of the population? Is that what we are 2% of the, uh, not 2% of the population, 2% of vehicle population. Population wise is a much, much smaller number of percentage. So we started looking at differently. We said, let's first focus on public transport, three wheelers and buses. We got together a meeting, meeting like this. CXOs of electric vehicles, three wheelers, and we asked them kitna deti hai. We asked, what is this kitna deti hai? Well, we understand in uh, the, uh, this in kitna deti hai in, um, in the petrol vehicles, kilometers per liter. We asked the question, what is the kilometers per kilowatt hour? It took some time for them to understand and give the answer. But they came up with the answer that this is more like 70 to 80 kilowatt hour watt hour per kilometer, which means 12 kilometers per unit of electricity. We asked the question, why? Why can you not reduce it? Why can you not, for example, get to 45 to 50 watt hour per kilometer, which will give you 20 kilometer per unit of electricity? People sort of say, how does it make a difference? Says, well, what is the main reason why we cannot do it? Most people said it cannot be done. And we showed that if you actually are able to, to do that, you are able to reduce the battery size by 35 to 40 percent because you need less amount of power per kilometer. So for a given range, you need a smaller amount of electricity. And if you get rid of 35 to 40 percent, significantly more, you will be able to break, come close to break even. Believe it or not, it took the industry almost eight to nine months, helped by some startups. Today, most of the industry is between 50 to 52 watt hour per kilometer from starting from 80 watt hour per kilometer. Same thing they did in the buses. Starting with 1600 watt hour per kilometer, they went out down to 900 watt hour per kilometer. But this was still not enough. What is the next step that they can have to do? Because they're still expensive. So then we sort of say, why can't you split the battery into smaller size? But the smaller size battery will mean range that you can t go is limited. What do you do after that? Do you wait for charging? And it will take an hour for charging or more. We said, why not do battery swapping? They are small batteries, why not swap it? If you do battery swapping, then the cost significantly comes down. What is more important, that one of the big problem that we had about India's temperature, today's temperature is 46 degrees centigrade outside. You try to charge, fast charge a battery, lithium ion battery, you are almost going to destroy it life cycles. If you do this, then if you do swapping, then the battery can be taken indoors and can be charged in two hours. Vehicle has already gone with another battery. Suddenly this problem also gets solved. And that brought us to the concept of what is called energy operator. Separate vehicle business and energy business. Vehicle can be purchased without battery. If purchased without battery, it is no, not more expensive than a petrol vehicles. Batteries are purchased by somebody else who is called an energy operator who will buy the battery, charge it and make it available to the vehicle people for swap, swap, the, swap it at, and at lease the battery. If you lease the battery, the cost per kil kilowatt hour or equivalently cost per kilometer comes equivalent to that of a petrol diesel vehicle. 
no subsidy needed. What does it really take? Well, one can then take this whole thing in volume and suddenly whole thing explodes. So this is the approach that was used and it took almost a year for all these things to be developed. The battery has to be developed such that it cannot be stolen. So there was a locked smart battery that was created which essentially cannot be charged by anybody but, ex but authorized chargers and cannot be discharged except in the vehicle where it is fitted. Once something like this, it took us almost a year and today there is a pilot that is going on. It is taking place at IIT Madras in fact by large number of operators. The list of the companies that I gave you are actually participating in trials and getting this vehicle ready and hopefully it will be launched in Ghaziabad next month and 150 cities there are companies like SL infrastructure, PGCIL, various other companies which are actually launching it in a very big manner. What about private vehicle? Private vehicle again batteries dominate the cost. For example if you take a vehicle the batteries dominate the cost and if you take large battery like in Tesla 550 kilometers, the cost becomes enormous. If you take a small battery, the problem of charging will take place. You have to need fast charger. But even the fast charger can charge in one hour. You can of course use higher cost battery, but the cost goes up again tremendously. Then you can charge them faster. But if you use ordinary battery like the one that Mahindra uses or Tata's uses, use, then you have to take wait for one hour. And the day you are traveling longer distance, you don't want to wait for one hour. And this became a serious problem. The alternative came something else. Let's take a small car, a car like Alto, cost around 4.25 lakhs rupees. If I design, if we design this car with a about 90 to 100 kilometer battery, the cost will be only around 5 lakhs. Then it can be charged overnight, and 90 to 100 kilometer you can run in the day without much of problem. I've been driving a vehicle like that from Mahindra for last three years, and I see no problem, except. 90% of the days, 10% of the days, suddenly I want to travel more than 80, 90 kilometers. And suddenly I'm nervous. That's the day you'll need something else, either a fast charger or something else. Fast charger, I have to find a fast charger and wait for one hour. That's not acceptable. We said, why not design these vehicles with two battery compartment? One battery is fixed 100 kilometers, but there's a space for a second 100 kilometer battery. And I dri drive to a Bharat Petroleum station which has the second battery available, charged, and it will fit in the battery for that day. I can certainly now go 200 kilometers. I don't have any range anxiety. Hmm? I don't have to do fast charging. I'll come back and charge my first battery overnight, and this battery after usage, I'll return it to another Bharat Petroleum station. And if I need to go travel more than 200 kilometers, long distance from here to Chandigarh, I will take a second battery, start driving after about two, two and a half hours when I'm exhausted with the battery, I'll swap that at another Bharat Petroleum petrol station. So this mechanism, totally different from what is done in the world, suddenly makes whole thing viable. A car costs around five lakhs. It, is, it doesn't require, mm, charge it at the home and have a, when you require, take on a second battery. This is an approach that was used not only for four wheelers, Tata's and Mahindra's are developing it, but also for two wheelers. Two wheelers, you come with a 40, 45 kilometer battery, very low cost, similar to the petrol uh, vehicles. And the day you need extra battery, you swap in a second battery. That's the kind of approach that was needed. So basically, we try to get things done with these four methods. First, energy efficient. Second, try to develop the battery ecosystem in the country. Third, the charging and swapping infrastructure. You can either charge, fast charge, nothing to prevent you from fast charging, or have option of swapping. And fourth is demand and generation. With this, things have been going on. The vehicles are ready, batteries are ready, and we are likely to be launching in the next month. The four wheelers with battery swap are likely to take another six months. And one with the buses, even the buses, Chetan may have talked about in the last session, can actually be done with battery swapping quite easily. The cost comes down very significantly. Charging and swapping infrastructure ready. The low cost charging uh, um, protocols have been defined. High cost, high power ones has not been defined. And the rest of the things, yellow basically means is still to be done, will actually get done this year. What about batteries? This was another major thing. Are we going to start importing batteries instead of importing oil? Well, battery consists of three parts. 
One is what's called battery pack manufacturing. That is a 30% value add. There is a cell manufacturing, which is another 30% value add. And then there is a materials, which is about 40% cost. Pack manufacturing, fortunately, there are about 40 startups in India which emerged in the last three years. And that's a good thermal design, good battery management system, good mechanical design, and they are doing wonders. And they have, they have teamed up with big companies like Amar Raja and Excite, and today the battery packs are being manufactured in India without any difficulty. What about cell manufacturing? This is one area of weakness, the red color. Basically implies a weakness. We need an external tie-up because the chemistry is a very dependent on chemistry and very dependent on process, keeps on changing very rapidly, and we need external tie-ups. And there are companies who are doing tie-ups. By the end of the year, they will be announcing that they will, not, they will actually start manufacturing cells in India. They take about 18 months to set up the factory, but their process has started. The most difficult thing was the material, because without material, Lithium, manganese, cobalt, nickel, graphite, we will be just dependent on outside like oil. Fortunately, there, are, there was a company, a startup, eight years back, started taking batteries from our cell phones and laptops and started recycling that, taking out the lithium, manganese, cobalt. Today, it is able to recover 95% of lithium and manganese uh, and 93% and of cobalt and are going off very, very quickly. What is most important, what do they do with this material? The material is so pure that today it is using, used in a pharmaceutical industry. So next time you take out a tablet and eat it, it may have a lithium which has come from a used cell phone, battery of a used cell phone. This is getting done in India. We are just scaling it up and saying we will become the uh, capital of urban mining and we will drive this. I will come towards the end. So basically industry has woken up and the prime work that has still not been done is transforming small and medium auto industries which are in conventional IC engine. What do you do as the transformation takes place and developing new power electronics industry. And finally, we need a comprehensive long term policy which has still been a problem, strong R&D, a weakness, electricity production from renewables, a lot of things being shown, but we need to enhance that. And finally, the, we have to keep on watching on the new technology. This is what is actually needed. We have done so much of work over the last year and a half that we are ready to really launch in a very, very big way. And we, our path, however, will be very different from the rest of the world. So there will be criticism from everywhere, because nobody understands that. But it comes from two of our basic requirements. First, our affordability is low. Number two, we have no money to provide large scale subsidy. And therefore, we have to have alternate approach. And alternate approach, industry by and large, has worked out. And the rest of the companies that I have given there, and it is only getting more and more, is just gearing to go full fledged. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Junjunwala. If you'll allow me to just pose a, a couple of questions. Uh, you mentioned the two things that we required. One is a long-term EV policy. Uh, the entire industry has been asking for that for some time. How imminent do you feel uh, such a policy is? Uh, finally, things are moving. Till two months back, things were still haywire, divided, distributed between different departments, different ministries, each taking it in a different direction. Right now, Right from the top, there seems to be serious interest in driving and harmonizing it. I'll keep my fingers crossed. We are hoping that something like this will happen over the next three to four months. Great. We'll all keep our fingers crossed on But on the important level. thing that you will see is there will be either limited or practically no subsidy. You have been hearing all things about fame too, etc. Some small things may be there, but scaling up. And we need to scale up. If you don't scale up, We'll just start importing everything. That is the biggest danger. We cannot let our jobs go. We cannot let our economy collapse in this manner. Uh, Dr. I.V. Rao from Maruti was here earlier. I'm not sure if he's still in the audience. But uh, you mentioned the Alto. 
A company like Maruti says that if you take a conventional internal combustion engine, small car of theirs currently, and you convert that into an EV, immediately it becomes twice the price, which then makes it unaffordable. What, what would you say to a statement like provided that? provided you put a 300 kilometer battery. That's what I was trying to explain to you. So you take out the battery, the cost is much less. We have done the detailed comp computations. The cost is in the battery. Battery cost half. What we are trying to do, use a very small battery, and then the cost addition is marginal. And when you need extra batteries, swap it. Don't go for 300, 500, 600 kilometer range battery. Go for 100 kilometer and go for add-on add 100 kilometer only on the day you need. 90% of the days you don't travel more than 40, 50 kilometers. We are in good shape. This is the approach. If you don't use the approach, what he is saying is 100% true. The approach that we are talking about is new, has not been done anywhere. So there is always going to be a question, should India do it first? Should it wait for somebody else? Well, India is soon going to become the country with the largest population. It better try to find its own solution. Thank you very much. And thank you for the I'll positivity in your in message. Here uh, I'll just time. ask any of the other panel members before you, uh, before you leave us if you have any questions for Dr. Junjunwala. I had one question for Dr. Junjunwala. You had one question for Dr. Junjunwala. Dr. Junjunwala, this talk, you know, you've, you've been actually professing the battery swapping for some time now. What do you think are the challenges why it's not able to get the traction? You know, what? even though for India, this is probably the best solution. Yeah, it took, it, the idea came about 14 months back. Uh, we had to work on these vehicles to reduce the, to enhance the energy efficiency. We had to get the battery developed. These has to be locked smart batteries. All the protocols has to be developed. All this has taken almost a year to develop. Right now, large scale testing is going on and I'm expecting the launch to take place in a month or two months or sooner. It takes time. Remember, vehicle, new kind of vehicle development takes fairly significant amount of time. We are talking about very short time in which all this has been developed. And large number of companies, not one or two. There are six or seven companies which will have three wheelers. There are another seven companies which will have two wheelers. There will be four or five companies which will do the batteries. And there will be multiple energy operators. Uh, it's a very nice presentation. Made me think back to my college days. I was having a good lecture, so it was very good. Um, I was here last year, and I've seen this in also in Taiwan. There are companies, Honda for example, uh, doing two-wheeler battery swapping. One of the things that they propose, which I wanted to get your opinion, they also were able to use the battery as a distributed energy source. For those villages or people living who may not have power or have a brownout, they're able to actually use that to uh, support their livelihood in their home. Yeah, so that's the only place where it is working, two wheelers, and we have studied that there is really nothing very uh, 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 different. I think it can actually be done. Yes, it can be tomorrow used for DER, distribution energy resource, but I'll say start with the vehicle, scale it up, then start thinking uh, elsewhere. One of the first question that I was told is that if I do the battery swapping, somebody will steal and run away with the battery. So I think these are unique things about India that we need to really solve. Thank you. I'll, I'll uh, wait there. Do, Dr. Jinjinwala, before you leave, may I request a memento, please? Oh. Hi. Hi. I'm going to be there. I'm not leaving. Okay. okay. But Thank you very okay. much. But I don't want to participate in the panel. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, we are running slightly short on time, so if I could request the panelists to keep their comments brief. Uh, Mr. Alan Tom Abraham is analyst at Bloomberg New Energy Finance. Uh, Alan, if you have any comments to make. Sure. Um, as, the, uh, as we start off the session, thank you so much uh, for this opportunity. And uh, I, I'm happy that uh, Professor uh, Junjunwala gave a, a brilliant uh, brilliant summary of what has been the discussion, what's been uh, talked about in the industry for some time. And I would like to uh, bring about what we at Bloomberg New Energy Finance uh, think about the EV journey uh, that India is, uh, is planning to take. Uh, take, uh, take. So every year we, uh, we look at various uh, global markets and uh, try to understand how electric vehicles uh, uh, 
and the industry progress across all these uh, different countries. And uh, so we, we come out with uh, an electric vehicle outlook annually. And uh, this year we've done it for India as well. And uh, what we see is that even though there has been uh, a lot of claims about 100% uh, conversion of all sales, of all new sales into EVs by 2030, and subsequent uh, scaling downs later on to about 30%, 40%. Uh, but what uh, we uh, get to see from a very economic perspective without taking into consideration the battery swapping methodology and all of that uh, for uh, passenger EVs, that is four wheelers, uh, we only expect uh, a lower, uh, lower penetration of EVs by 2030, which, uh, which is what uh, we feel. It, it would be uh, a tad less than 10%. But 2030 is the pivot year uh, for uh, EVs because that's when the real economic benefits of uh, owning an EV starts capitalizing and uh, then the, the, the trajectory takes off. And what we feel is by uh, 2040, almost 30% uh, 30, uh, almost 30 of uh, all new vehicle sales in the country is uh, going to be electric, and uh, this is no small feat, given that uh, the automobile industry in India is, po uh, is, is positioned to grow over the whole period that we consider, given, given the demographic dividend of the country and also uh, the growing uh, uh, the, the prosperity that we expect from, uh, from, uh, from the country's uh, GDP percolating down to GDP per capita and uh, overall prosperity growing. So having said that, uh, this, is, this is purely based on uh, economics, that is the total cost of ownership, and, uh, and this is only for passenger four-wheelers and uh, through private adoption. But what we see is there is real uh, real prospects when it comes to two-wheelers, three-wheelers, and public transportation, just like uh, Professor Junjunwala just uh, rightly mentioned. So these are vehicle categories that account for almost 80% of the total vehicle fleet in the country. And any sort of uh, popularization of EVs in these three categories will really be much more impactful when it comes to our, our objectives. So if you list down the objectives, one is definitely the oil bill, the second is the manufacturing prospects, and third is pollution. And uh, for all these three aspects, uh, when we look at it, these three categories, that is three wheelers, two wheelers, and buses, which is uh, the public transportation, will, will actually uh, be the right first targets for electrification for a country like India in order to achieve uh, you know, our goals around these three aspects. So what we feel is uh, from the passenger vehicle segment, uh, some of the bottlenecks like uh, what we feel is resulting in this slower trajectory for India is one. Uh, there is, again, this was again rightly mentioned by prof the professor earlier, is the lack of visibility of a long-term plan. So if we take what has happened in the renewable energy sector, in 2014, uh, when the government put out a long-term target of 100 gigawatts of solar and 75 gigawatts of wind by 2022, there was initially a lot of uh, discussion about whether this is possible, whether this is required. But what happens is the industry slowly starts catching up. And uh, this target gives a lot of visibility for a lot of investments both from within the country and also from outside. And uh, I believe the new policies that would be coming out in the form of FAME 2 or any other long-term vision that the country can put forward uh, with respect to their targets, their visions about, and their policy structures, how they're going to uh, support the, uh, the industry and uh, nurture its growth is going to be very crucial for uh, the, the the uptake of uh, or the growth of the electric vehicle industry as a whole. And uh, the second one is slightly related to this. So once the policy, uh, the policy angle falls in place, then the investors such as auto, automakers, 
the ancillary industries and other, uh, uh, and other supporting industries like the EV charging businesses, all of them start falling in place. And what happens is then more and more investments happen in the country and more and more uh, vehicles are announced in the country. And as a result, so as and when the consumer uh, choice keeps improving, keeps increasing, then there is a greater uh, popularity for electric vehicles within, so every other country, so if we, if we look at uh, most of the countries uh, that has happened globally, even though we cannot extrapolate the same uh, to a developing country like India, so uh, the number of choices that a consumer has when he goes to buy a car, because it's a very, very big uh, capital expenditure he's making, uh, is, is very crucial to the growth of the industry forward. And we've seen that as and, as and when the number of models keep increasing, the, the, the growth of the industry keeps increasing in the same proportion. So that's one thing. And uh, the affordability thing, uh, or the affordability aspect, thanks to the global scale and the ambitions uh, put by the larger automakers globally and then uh, by, uh, by the, gov the, the central push from the Chinese government, a lot of refinement has been happening on the battery front with respect to technology, with respect to cost reduction, with respect to so many other aspects that uh, we also can learn from these uh, drivers which will help us adopt these technological advances, advancements and then use them to our advantage and bring down the cost of vehicles which can then be affordable to the mass market which represents more than 80% of all the vehicle sales in the country. So given the, uh, the, the, the paucity of time, I would uh, just summarize by saying that yes, uh, this industry is going to stay and this industry has a lot of growth prospects for a country which uh, has about 7% of its GDP coming from automobile uh, industry. But uh, some things have to fall in place and uh, we, have, we are seeing initial, uh, initial action into these, addressing these concerns and uh, we are certainly positive that uh, the, the, there's a lot of prospect for electric vehicles which is beneficial uh, for, for us from, from a pollution perspective, from a country's oil bill perspective and also from a manufacturing perspective. Thank you, uh, Mr. Abraham. Uh, Mr. Girish Kamala is Director and Country Head Automotive Infineon Technologies. Uh, Mr. Kamala, if we can yeah. have your comments, please. Sure. Thank you, Dhruv. Uh, let me bring a perspective from, you know, the guys at the bottom of the food chain. We are the semiconductor manufacturers. That is basically the building blocks of uh, all of these technologies. So uh, I represent Infineon Technologies, and we are a global semiconductor manufacturer in the areas of uh, automotive, chip card, uh, industrial, as well as mass market segments. Okay, so Dr. Junjunwala mentioned about policies. These become even more critical for someone like us because when policies are defined for the next year or the year after, we basically have to go back five years because the technologies that we work on, the new technologies that need to be developed, take at least about three to five years before they actually can be productionized. The investment costs are pretty high. For example, a new fab costs about between four to six billion dollars to put up a new fab. And the development of new technologies between 10 to 20 million dollars at the least to develop them. So very important why the policies really matter. And for example, you know, we can't always use technologies that are developed for the Western world. Indian conditions, you know, and then we talked about affordability the efficiencies do not really mean the same in India as it would mean in the rest of the world. So these are very critical why policies are very important to actually be you know, a kind of sacrosanct for us in order to actually make the investment for development, which is very critical, you know, because it's about five years from, for us, you know, what we call as time to market of any kind of new products that actually come in. Other very important thing also here is uh, definition in terms of policies because that helps in defining the various systems. Because today we are at the crossroads in determining what kind of products would go into different systems. For example, let's take 
two wheelers, three wheelers or passenger vehicles. Now, are these all automotive grade products that you need for these? Are these industrial grade products? There is no clear definition or is the policy just going to be that there is going to be a black box and we really don't care what's inside. So I think these are very important why policy is very important in helping define the ecosystem. Now, you know, there's always a saying we have in the market, you know, we all talk about first mover advantage. But I think here in this industry, we're looking at more because in terms of the investment that needs to be made, a kind of a first mover disadvantage, somebody's got to invest. Somebody's got to come up and put up the money first in order to build the infrastructure and known with a lot of uh, what we want to do in India. You know, we want a two-year or a three-year return on investment which is really very difficult to happen here. Maybe looking at a long-term eight, 10 years before you actually see a lot of the returns on the investment you make. You know, Dr. Junjunwala talked about battery swapping stations, but somebody has got to invest for it. You know, the government as well as the ministry has been very clear in a lot of our meetings that they do not have the money to actually put up the investment for the batteries. Because if they're going to be half the cost, who's going to invest? Somebody has got to put up the money. And I think that's a big issue. Also, if you look at in terms of technology and batteries, today the three-wheeler EVs or the two-wheeler EVs that you see, a lot of them still use the lead-acid batteries. So the transition has to happen from the lead-acid batteries into the lithium-ion. And there's a lot of challenges. You know, and Dr. Junjunwala showed in his slides, there are these challenges that we have to overcome in order for us to actually, actually have to do this. The other important thing is, uh, you know, we talk of policies also as uh, clear clarity, timelines, roadmap, that has to come out from the government. You know, there was a lot of noise, and if, you know, in the last year, after the announcement by Mr. Gadkari about 2030, all vehicles gonna be EV. Uh, you know, there was a lot of hype, a lot of, uh, you know, I think we were at almost these uh, EV seminars every other week, but it's kind of died down now after the government came up about not having, uh, you know, a clear definition of policies. EESL announced about a tender for 10,000 vehicles. After the first 500, at least I haven't heard what happened to the other 9,500. When are they going to be delivered to the government? And as long as the government does not come up with these tenders on a regular basis, people don't have information on a clear roadmap where it is headed. As an industry, it really holds us back from putting up the money because it's a lot of money. And if you look at the other markets, there is a lot more clarity there for us to make the investment. So the government has to take a big step here to make things clear of what they really want and what would be you know, the definition specifications that we could actually start to look at and make the investments. Because all of us want to live in a clean environment. Looking at the, you know, and some of the, when the smog and hit last October, it was not a fun time to be here in Delhi. And if you want to avoid this, there has to be small steps that we would have to take. And that's definitely something we could do, yeah? The other thing is building up the ecosystem. You know, we talk about all of, uh, you know, electrification, doing this. Do we even have, you know, we make the investment, put up the infrastructure, you have charging stations everywhere. Do we even have the ecosystem built up? If your car breaks down, an electric car, do you, can you take it to any mechanic to get it fixed? Your battery doesn't work, a lithium ion battery doesn't work. Can you go anywhere? You know, the ecosystem also takes a long time to build and we need to invest. And university courses today don't really focus on helping the graduate in engineers, helping them learn these technologies to help build the ecosystem, which is very critical. And I can give you a specific example of when we set up a plant in Malaysia. It was about 15 years ago. And as a company, we invested and actually took about 500 young engineers over to Germany for six months to train them. Yes, we understand. Half of those people, when they came back, left. We do understand, but it's very important that without that investment, we would never have been able to set up a plan because we can't have expats in running all these. We need the local people with the technology. And there's a lot of graduating engineers, very aspiring ones, but we really need to help that grow. So I think overall, you know, it's very easy, but it's, you know, it's a lot of deliberations have happened. But really, I think in the end, the government really needs to make their intentions very clear what they really want to do. That will then help define, because everyone's kind of now sitting on the wall. You know, we're not able, nobody wants to make the plunge and make the investment till you know what really there is. Yeah?
So I'd like to end because you know, I could go on for a long time, but I think I'll end for city of time. Thank you. Thank you, Girish. Uh, and I know you have a flight to catch this evening, so uh, we'll excuse you at 5 o'clock if we uh, continue thereafter. But I have a quick question since you're leaving. Um, and you talked about the practical aspects of using electric vehicles and the technology. Um, you know, what we've noticed, uh, especially with the current German car, especially, is they're packed with electronics. Um, and those seem to be more vulnerable in Indian conditions than they would be in the West, for instance. Essentially, an EV is just big, massive power electronics. Uh, do you see that as a concern of uh, them being more vulnerable in our conditions than elsewhere in the world? No, not really, because if you look at, see, those electronics are really different from what electronics you would have in an EV. An EV as a vehicle would be a lot simpler than even your IC engine that you have today. You know, you don't have that many moving components. A lot of those are static, are not moving other than the drive and the transmission, because today an engine you have probably three, four hundred parts that are moving at all times. So no, it's probably going to be a lot simpler and much more easy to adapt. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Manoj Karwa is Vice President, Clean Wave Technologies. Uh, Manoj, would you like to use the podium or? I'm good now. Okay. Thank you. Uh, very uh, honored to be here with a prestigious panel. Um, honored to be able to invest in India with our partner, Tato Autocomp. This has been an interesting trip to India, starting in Detroit, coming to Mumbai, Pune, Aurangabad, now Delhi, in a few days, Hyderabad. So through this trip, I've gotten a lot of the sounds, tastes, and smells of India. So I've been enjoying that. Um, as part of, uh, as I'm sure you know, in 2017, there was 1.2 million plug-in vehicles that were uh, sold globally. And based on uh, production and sales 2008 year to date, we're on track for 50% increase in electrified vehicles, passenger, uh, buses, trucks. The heart of these electric vehicles is the electric drive system, electric motor. Hence, my discussion today is about the political, economic, social, and technical aspect about rare earth elements that are used in electric motors and drive systems. So, um, you know, rare earth elements are a series of chemicals found in the earth crust, and they're used in a lot of modern conveniences that we take for granted here in India and abroad. For example, in computers, networks, uh, medical devices, even national security. So, um, the rare earth elements provide unique magnetic, luminescent, electrochemical properties that make things faster, more durable, uh, miniaturize, and uh, give better thermal stability. Um, with that, uh, rare earth enabled products help fuel global economic growth. In the last 60 years, China invested heavily in rare earth global, uh, rare earth elements, and uh, they now uh, have 97% of the supply. For those Indians in the audience, your neighbor, China, has 97% of rare earth elements which you'll need as you pursue electrified growth. So um, rare, rare earth enabled products really help fuel a lot of the things that we take for granted. Uh, dysprosium, which is an essential element in the creation of neodymium magnets, what makes electrified vehicles, hybrids, plug-in hybrids, and battery electric vehicles very efficient, and also including turbines. As an example, in the US, we import 91% of our rare earth elements from China. Uh, we tried unsuccessfully to uh, mine them in the US and Nevada, but because of um, our environmental standards, uh, we were able to do it economically feasible. And I don't think um, India wants to replace the pollution from fossil fuels with the pollution from rare earth elements. Um, in addition, rare earths don't form uniformly in the ground. As an example, one ton of, one ton of rare earth elements uh, only produce about 250 kilograms of useful material. But with that mining, you also produce um, uh, wastewater, solid waste, radioactive elements, and also airborne particulates. So again, a very critical issue in selecting um, electrified vehicle supply. You really don't want to rely on one country for the entire supply. In addition, there's a, a political aspect uh, to rare earth mining. Um, this goes back to 2010, where there was uh, a conflict in the Pacific Ocean between Japan and China. Um, a Chinese shipping boat collided uh, with a uh, Coast Guard Japanese ship. And this escalated between the two countries, and the tension continued. The result was that China uh, restricted the supply of rare earth to Japan. 
What did that mean? It meant that the rare earth element prices uh, increased by tenfold. So again, a political issue. Um, now let's talk about the environmental concerns. Um, th there's been an ongoing black market concern uh, with uh, rare earth mining. Uh, I give you the example of Guangzhou City in northern China, where the pollution problem there is exasperated uh, because of the black market nature, and the Chinese government has had to spend 38 billion RMB, which I, th I believe is about 4,000 karod, to do the cleanup. So again, uh, this relates back to uh, when I was in Pune last year at iTech. I think it was an Indian politician said, in our pursuit of electrification in India, do we really want to replace OPEC or Middle Eastern foreign oil with Chinese magnets? So these are all very important issues. Um, and as Indian OEMs uh, review, and they have a lot of choices for electric drive systems, they need to look at the political, economic, social, technological issues. We at Cleanway believe that the right solution uh, for the Indian market, and for really all markets outside of China, is to look at solutions that don't use permanent magnets, don't use the key elements like dysprosium and neodymium that go into the permanent magnets, but look at AC induction motors. AC induction motors have uh, been around for 100 years. You may have it in your home and the ceiling fan. If designed well, it can be very efficient, provide very compact size, uh, less weight, um, and in addition, it uses readily available materials, such as aluminum and copper, which are found in India. And being able to produce this without using permanent magnets will help uh, reduce or eliminate some of these issues that I mentioned. So I'm very excited to be here. I'm excited to invest in the Indian market with our partner, Tata Autocomp. And um, we've developed some new customers and uh, uh, looking forward to the discussion as we go further. Thank you, Manoj. Um, uh, and you're absolutely right. We talk a lot about EVs and reducing tailpipe emissions, but we're, we're not looking at the environmental impact of, uh, for instance, in South America, I believe, uh, in certain parts of South America where they mine for lithium, it's completely changed the ecosystem in the area. Um, so there's definitely different aspects of uh, the issue that we need to look at. Uh, Mr. Avadesh Kumar Jha is Vice President at Fortum. Uh, sure, please. Uh, but I would request you just in the paucity of time to keep it short if you don't mind. Good afternoon. Uh, so I represent Fortum, which is a Finland-based energy utility company. And uh, we have been operating uh, charging stations in Nordic for the last seven years. And we are the largest operator in Norway, which is the leading uh, in terms of EV adoption. When I attend to these kind of conferences, you know, sometimes I get confused that what exactly we are aiming at when we talk of the EV. The primary driver, I mean driver for the EV globally is the emission, mitigation of the emission, and the mitigation of the pollution. And when we talk of the pollution, you know, in the Indian road, which is the primary contributor or supposed to be the primary contributor of the emission? I think it's car. Even if you talk, the official number published by Siam, you know, by, I mean, uh, 2020, 2017, 2017, 13 percent of the vehicle sold is car. Three-wheeler, three percent. Bus, three percent. Bus, I mean, when I say uh, bus means including commercial vehicles. 81 percent is two-wheeler. So two-wheeler, yes, definitely. But the car is supposed to be the major contributor towards the pollution. And when we hear from the government that our focus is not the car, you know, I get confused. In the cities, in the urban areas, because if, if I, my data is correct, probably 11 or 14 cities out of the world's most polluted city belong to Indian cities. And Indian cities, and, and we Indians are aspirational. In the middle class are aspirational. So we aspire to drive a, e -electric, I mean, a car, not a three-wheeler, not a two-wheeler. So two-wheeler wants to migrate to the owning the four-wheeler. And on the EV, which is a new technology, which is supposed to be you know, uh, mitigating this climate change need, at a policy front, at a government front, we are trying to push it towards the back end that no, this is not the priority today. Priority is three-wheeler. I'm afraid 
you know, when we are talking to these three-wheelers, how many of us are interacting with the three-wheeler users? You're not addressing the, you're addressing the audience, you're addressing the uh, stakeholders who are not the user of the three-wheelers. And we are talking that three-wheeler is the, you know, the first should be the three-wheelers. Whereas my view is that it is a holistic approach. You can't leave car separately that it will be done after five years or 10 years. It means then the influencer of the society you are leaving behind. And if the influencer like you, if they are left behind, they will have less interest in adopting the new technology. And everybody knows that the new technology is a costly. Who will be the early adopters? I'm surprised. Three-wheeler will not be the early adopters. Which of the three-wheeler, especially in India, where you have now started with makeshift arrangement of lead acid, those drivers who get this fitted at the roadside shop, workshop, would you be able to sell them at three lakh car, three lakh three-wheelers? So my single point is that when we are addressing any policy, when we are talking of addressing the larger issue of the pollution, please keep electric vehicle car is one of your major partners. You cannot simply push it back that after five years or 10 years or in phase three, we'll adopt it. Yes, if you are planning to give subsidy, then you can say, fine, we will not give it to the car because that's supposedly to be the, used by the affluent society, it's fine. But you are not giving the subsidy to anyone. You are not planning to give subsidy to the sector itself then why you are making a differentiation on the policy front? You make neutral. If the, if the user wants a car, why should you say that, no, we will uh, have it phase four or phase five? Now, having said so, I would say, so, I mean, I mean so, so my approach is that it should be addressed to all the audience, to the two-wheelers, three-wheelers, and the technology is same. Now, coming back to this battery swapping, you know, we strongly believe that the battery swapping is something which is more workable in those fleet, those vehicles, which has a standardized design. The car, the four-wheeler, you know, I mean, the electric vehicle, I, I, I'm a civil engineer, I don't have understanding of the automobile, but electric vehicle, to my understanding, drives the performance either from the motor or from the battery. How would the OEMs make a differentiation in their electric vehicle if you design all the cars with the same size of the battery or same shape of the battery? If you are if you're planning that it will be a different, the OEMs will be given the freedom to design their car, you know, according to the different battery size. It means what you are trying to do is that pushing back the cost from the OEMs to the battery operator or the energy operator. This means an energy operator will be required to make an inventory of 100 number of models of the car. That is simply not feasible. So I, I mean, we personally believe that yes, three wheelers is a fit case for the battery swapping. Two-wheelers is a good case for the battery swapping. I don't know how many individuals would be interested in two-wheelers, but three-wheeler is a fleet where the driver probably would not be concerned with that, whether you know, he has to change the old battery with the new battery, or the new battery with the old battery. They would be more keen to implement it as long as the cost comes down. And for an energy operator, it will be more easier because all the three-wheelers can be mandated to have the same design because this could be a three kilowatt hour battery or four kilowatt hour battery, and they are supposed to run 50 kilometer or 25 kilometer or 40 kilometers. So there it is feasible. So the limited point which I'm, you know, I would like to conclude is that we should, when we design, design from the Indian perspective and take the behavior into account. We are you know, facing the music of the bad highway design where we have created this flyover not for the 100 years, but then to the next 25 years population. And now, by the time the flyover gets completed, you have a complete jam over the flyover itself. So please take the behavior also, what kind of society we are. We are a hierarchical society generally. We are a hierarchical society. We want to maintain that hierarchy. So please keep that also in mind. That's realistic. And if you adopt you know, policy according to that, probably we will be, have a sustainable long-term you know, uh, achievement on the EV side. Otherwise, you know, we might have stuck with early uh, investment in the three-wheelers and the public transport, which is not very, I would say, as a user, 
we don't find the public transport uh, worth riding as a, as a user. So in a crowded uh, bus, how many of us would like to go to the office? So sometimes we are talking something which is more utopian, not realistic. My submission is that let's be realistic. I would suggest that the first target should be to address the car. How can we make the car affordable? That should be the focus. And that will address the whole uh, question of the pollution, the whole question of bringing down the cost of the technology. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Avadish. Uh, it comes back to our expectation of a long-term EV policy. So hopefully it will be slightly utopian and realistic at the same time. So, but it's, a, it's a tough ask either way. Um, Mr. Uh, Samir Malhotra was uh, supposed to join us. Uh, he, couldn't, he couldn't be here today, but he's, uh, we are joined by Mr. Sudeep Kumar Banerjee, who's uh, Vice President Business Development at uh, Sriram Auto Mall. Yep. Right, please. Okay. Hello. Yeah, uh, I'm Sudeep. I am representing uh, Sriram Auto Mall here. So in context of uh, EVs, I would like to first introduce uh, my company, what we do, and relate to the prospect of EV implementation in India. Uh, we are a small piece. We are not a manufacturer. We are a service provider and a marketplace. So uh, we are into the business of disposals, uh, and we are into the business of used vehicles, right from uh, two-wheelers to construction equipment, uh, cars, particularly uh, commercial cars, even uh, private cars. We do auctions. It's primarily for the banks, NBFCs, insurance companies, the salvage. And we park vehicles. We have yards across the country. Now, uh, we are in touch with the uh, people. So our parent company, Shram Transport Finance, is the largest uh, financer in commercial vehicle space, in the uh, refinance space. So we are in touch with the people on the ground who are the subprime segment and as a lot of panelists have uh, highlighted, uh, as a concept EV, uh, it's great. And uh, in terms of implementation is something that in India, we come across great ideologies. And when we try to implement, uh, things fall apart. So probably in the last mile, what we could do is probably help the, uh, the consumers, the actual target audience, as uh, someone said right now, that uh, three-wheelers, for example, they can't, the affordability. I would say rather the ease of adoption should be the priority, where it should be uh, convenient and uh, attractive enough for people to migrate from the existing uh, kind of vehicles to an EV vehicle. Uh, we are uh, facilitating and helping a lot of OEMs and their uh, dealerships to help in liquidating their trade-in stock, which is exchange vehicles, where People bring in their used vehicle, they book a new vehicle, and so on and so forth. On the same lines, we could help in the transition. So people come to us for selling their used vehicle and buy a, maybe a used vehicle as well. We could be a point of contact for people to buy an EV vehicle if they exchange their existing stock. We can help in liquidating these uh, exchange vehicles uh, you know, uh, to a place, as we see that I think for the passenger car at least, there would be a migration in phases and uh, vehicles which are no more operative in a city like maybe in Delhi to start off with, it could be moved to locations where the transition will take a little while. So there would be a breather, and these vehicles which are existing, uh, people are using it, they could move to those such locations, and uh, there would be a resale of it. There would be some price recovery. So it should not be a loss-making initiative and force down the truth of the people, look okay, from tomorrow it's uh, EV. So what happens to the existing target audience? Where is the f so the migration has to be smooth. Maybe we could be uh, a bridge or a facilitator or a catalyst for that matter, which can help uh, people to migrate from the existing uh, vehicles to uh, EV. Now a fundamental point, basically uh, we're seeing that the, <coughs> uh, the concept of EV is uh, very much a priority now because 2030 we are uh, moving ahead. In 2020, we are just uh, leapfrogging from uh, to, uh, uh, this Euro uh, 4 to directly to Euro 6. So there are investments from the part of OEMs also. Uh, I believe that is a cons they will be investing on that part for their vehicles to adapt. And again, also prepare themselves for the EV uh, vehicle. Now, the point is, if the objective of EV is to reduce carbon emission and the carbon footprints, 
So uh, now regarding these vehicles, these would require electricity to charge. So what is the source of this electricity? If we are again going to burn fossil fuels to create these power stations to charge these batteries, then what is the point? So the, I just leave it to the audience to uh, think. And if we have alternative source of uh, generating this electricity, uh, then probably it makes sense. Ultimately, we'll uh, reach somewhere. So that's something. <laughs> that's my point. <laughs> thank, thank you, Sudeep. Uh, and uh, as you rightly mentioned, it's very important to be on ground and understand what the consumers want because. I think one of the concerns at the moment from an OEM's perspective is so much investment is being made in EVs, but uh, is the demand uh, there to, uh, uh, to compensate for that investment? Um, Dr. Paritosh Nandi is director of Envert E-Vehicles. Uh, Dr. Nandi. Uh, I just want to take my phone three to four minutes. Sure, please. Is it already loaded onto? So, yeah, do you mind if uh, uh, we'll just uh, ask Mr. Abhishek uh, Ranjan, who's AVP System uh, Operation okay, and Head Renewable and DSM Initiatives at the BSES. Sir, if you would. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Abhishek, representing BSES Rajdhani, uh, which is a power distribution company in south and west part of Delhi, it's serving around uh, 750 square kilometers of the capital and around 2.4 million consumers. Now, uh, as far as the EV ecosystem is concerned, the power, uh, as we understand, uh, is a very vital component or the input for this to flourish. Therefore, and number one, number two, as Mr. Jha also talked about, what is the driver for EV? So it is about pollution. So how to minimize the pollution? So uh, we are uh, aware that we should not embark on a journey which will replace crude with coal. So in other words, we, we replace our ICE vehicles with electric vehicles which are getting charged from power which is getting produced by burning coal. So that means we are producing more and more pollution. Only thing is we are shifting pollution from here to somewhere else. So to avoid that, renewable integration as Professor Junjinwala also talked about is very important. To that extent, what is the readiness in Delhi, say for example, which I can talk about. We as a distribution company, we have already uh, tied up uh, around six to 700 megawatt of renewable power, that is wind and solar. And that is going to be in place in the next two years. So how does it help EV? Wind, as we know, uh, provides a, a lot of traction and power generation in the night time, off peak time. So that point in time, that wind power is available and that will be used for charging, charging the electric vehicles. So that um, helps out in breaking the log jam saying that the crude should not be replaced with the coal. Now, what about the network or the last mile network wherein the either the low tension network or the high tension network which is going to be used for charging of the vehicles either at a swapping station or a charging station. So as a distribution company uh, we are also uh, undertaking the studies of the different areas wherein the distribution capacity is in place or it requires strengthening so that in day one, anyone can come in. Like we, we all know the Ministry of Power has given a clarification that anybody can come and put up a, set up a charging station and that is to help facilitate uh, the, the flourishing of this particular initiative. So uh, that readiness is going to be in place. We already did some kind of study in area. The challenge which is coming out is the availability of space, which we are working with the space saving agencies like SDMCs or DMRC or PWD, etc. So that is the biggest challenge where we don't have clarity as we talk about the policies, etc. We don't have the clarity on the policy as to where these could come up. The next could be, uh, yes, so when we talk about the space, we can partner with the, any agency, individual, etc. who have the space in their uh, in vicinity or they, they are the owners of the space, approach us and then we can partner to create a charging network infrastructure in the city. And that is what we are working towards. We are working with them uh, very closely, trying to find out where all we can put them. Again, chicken and egg story, whether the EV comes in or the charging network, we are saying we are going to break the ice, saying that we are going to set up the charging infrastructure in selected areas of the city where we feel that the vehicle is going to come. Recently, Zoom Car launched its 100 vehicle strong platform, I mean, uh, based on E2O plus of Mahindra, that is an electric vehicle. So slowly and steadily, these will come. Now moving towards the e-rickshaws, which constitute a major electric vehicle in Delhi as on date as we speak. We need to create a legal charging uh, infrastructure as well as a battery swapping infrastructure for the same. For that space is required again. 
we are already uh, aware that what are the areas where the, those e-rickshaws apply. And we are aware where to give the connection and what is the EV infrastructure, etc. to be given. But the space is a problem. So the policy is, uh, again, the space has to be uh, very much uh, available where the agencies, the landowning agencies have to come forward. Maybe the government can take a lead role on this. And uh, finally, when any consumer or a landowning agency wants to set up a charging station, I take this as an analogy to the solar rooftop that is flourishing in uh, throughout the city. Any consumer can approach a vendor, I mean the discom, saying that he wants to put up a solar rooftop system. And there is a list or panel of particular OEM providers, those integrators, who can provide him the service, complete concept to commission. So that kind of ecosystem has to flourish in this EV as well, wherein there should be an impaneled list of OEMs of the electric vehicle charging station manufacturers, then these electric vehicle charging stations should be uh, backfed through a network charging operator. Just like you have a handset, mobile handset, and then you have a network service provider, similar concept. So these things should be in place for a particular person or an individual or agency who is having the space to opt for such kind of services. And once these things are in place, the electric discom, the power distribution company can play the role of integrator and facilitate the EV rollout, EV uh, charging infrastructure rollout. And that's all from my side. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Abhishek. Uh, being from the discom, you would be very familiar with power theft. Or, uh, in, in the case of a charging station in, in network, uh, space would be one issue, but I would assume that security would also be another uh, issue that would have to be addressed. So as far as security is concerned, the power theft is definitely there, the leakage of power is there. So uh, as far as security is concerned, we, we feel that it's very natural. Like so If we lower the prices, the current ongoing uh, black market prices for uh, e-rickshaw e charging, if we offer them a secure, safe, legal and much more economical service, which is legal, so definitely this leakage should be plugged. And apart from this, when we start this kind of legal charging infrastructure in place, we can approach the security services. Uh, to enforce the rule of law. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Nandi, please. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, my respected panelists, and uh, I'm Paritosh Nandi. I started uh, my career on renewable energy in date back to 1998. And this is the first time uh, the Ministry of uh, New and Renewable Energy, that time it was non-conventional energy sources, MNE, MNES. And they started giving fellowship on uh, NRD, National Renewable Energy Fellowship. So my point is, uh, so I, what I'm saying this, because I wanted to give you an idea that how this uh, renewable energy segment and later on this uh, EV segment has start, certainly uh, flashed out. Because in 2008, nobody thought that, okay, there will be some uh, national NAPCC, National Action on Climate Change, and, and um, there will be some national solar mission. And when it came, and that time I remember the per megawatt uh, cost of solar energy was around 25 crore per megawatt. And later on, it has come down to, I guess, 5 crore. So look the scale, how the solar energy slowly, uh, this is only because of the international uh, silicon prices. The same way, I think, um, uh, for the battery prices, as uh, Dr. Junyulala said, that this is the maximum cost of a uh, EV. So battery... I, I, one I know, Mr. Devi Prasad Das, you are from ISCS, you might be knowing that how much is the cost of this uh, uh, current lithium ion battery. So what is the uh, cost of KWH at this point in time? So my point is uh, just to compare these two lines, and as Mr. Adish Kumar Jha said that, okay, let's, let's focus on the cars, not on the two-wheelers. Even though the India has the 80% of the two-wheeler two -wheeler market, even the second largest two-wheeler market in India. So, so why? Because you cannot say anything on the policy level because that is the market forces that will determine the, which will take the, take the space. So uh, now my point is the create the demand, create the appropriate ecosystem, and find out the bottlenecks. So who will tell you the bottlenecks? Say for Dr. Junjulula is there, and all the greatest panelists are there. They should 
tell the government that these are the typical problems. Say for I, this Envati vehicle is a startup company. When I started it up, they said that, okay, we'll be giving you uh, an opportunity to uh, incubate. So how they will incubate? Because you do not have a requisite infrastructure. At this point in time, as Mr. Uh, Girish said, that government does not have the right colleges. That safer from the storage, say this is the question of electrical, uh, chemical engineering subject. So do you have a colleges? Safer, what I'm saying that MNRD started this, because the similar single window system the government has yet to start. So we should recommend the government that, okay, start some uh, in centers in IITs, IIMs, or whatever in universities, that these are the uh, centers where you can get the ready-made manpowers or the brains, or do the research scholar, get the research scholar right kind of research. Safer with respect to uh, infrastructure, with respect to, say, uh, chargers, I am telling you, we are quite confused that which charging standard we should consider. Is it uh, the European standard, or is it the Chinese standard, or the US standard? So I remember, for the, particularly for the solar case, we used to follow the German, uh, uh, this landscape, their, their renewable energy landscape, that 40 gigawatt by this, by that. So nobody talked about US, nobody talked about China. Now, particularly for the EV case, when charging and other things are coming, people are talking about China equally for the US. Even some experience they are bringing. Why, my point is there is enough space and enough capability in Indian soil that we can grow it from here. So basically, my point is what are the demands? How to create the demands? As Mr. Giri said, the rightly, you need to make it investment friendly so that investors come in. And also, so these are the factors why we're considering the EV and demand creation. This, this way you can create, the government can create the demand like public bus electrification, vehicle registrations, fleet operators, goods carrier. So grossly, they said all the case studies, technological or business case studies. I'm giving you the gist of these things. Local purchase benefit, like if you purchase the EV, even electric vehicle, so there will be no registration charges, like the example uh, that was followed by this tele on the Pradesh government last, last week. My, and typical lack is in the area of R&D at this point. What I felt, I may be wrong, the panelists can tell you something more about it. So there is no single window grant for this electric vehicles. Like they are giving something in IIT Madras, maybe in IIT uh, Kharagpur, but there is no specific, say for the second tier or th for three tier institutes, they f typically for the electric, from the DHI, there is no typical grant size. And I think this should be single window. That uh, everybody should know that this grant has been given to this institute and this is the output. Even in uh, charging, with respect to this charging point, I don't think uh, in the last two years any good uh, uh, this IP patent has been filed from the Indus Indian soil. I don't think so. So unless, until and unless you give, you, you create appropriate atmosphere, people will not be uh, enticed to do that. So that's why this grant is an very important, uh, the grants typically for this research lab and startup story I told you. Thus, typically uh, for my case study I'm telling you, they said that Department of Scientific and Industrial Research, they will give you uh, uh, this mentoring activity. Mentor, what mentoring they will do? They will uh, help you to file the patents or uh, the investment typically. And they said that you need uh, two person, uh, company needs, um, Say for DSI needs from company 2% of their stake. So uh, you have 50 crore paid up capital and you will be giving 2% of that to DSI. What is the guarantee that they will give you the five patents? There is no guarantee, no. You are not, they are not signing on a agreement that okay, the five patents will be filed for, from your end. So this thing cannot be done. This is my personal point of view that okay, if there is serious issue, serious patent, the government has to take due care that, okay, you cannot make any, even, even they ask for this 2% of their whole investment, it will make at the time of mentoring, maybe two years, three years down the line. 
So th that is, that's a huge amount and that is very much uh, uh, confusing also. And university institute collaboration, I said, at the speaker said that there are so many collaboration from the point of view of, of uh, company level. So that collaboration is in every field, in solar field, this, that, everywhere that is there. But with respect to EV, uh, can you tell me that two institute in India has collaborated over? I do not have any data on this. So this is a typical lacking uh, uh, from uh, our side. And also, uh, the charging, uh, with respect to uh, charging infrastructure, I told you already that there is no such patent. Everybody is talking about the charging, this charging, two-wheeler charging, four-wheeler charging. But there is no serious intellectual work has been done because of this infrastructural problem, not because of the lack of brain in India. This would be the strategic goal, as I said, this OEM should be and long-term implication as Mr. Adesh Kumar Jha, we, and it, it was in your name that big question, this, this might be one of the landscape event in India that this come, uh, finally this power ministry has given the clarification on why they should be, anybody can use the electricity. So this is the clarification. Under Electricity Act, it was the required license, but it does not need at this point. And Mr. Jha said that industry from industry's point of view, and it will create a level playing field. So this is the policy reform. This is slowly taking up. I think so many policies as we wanted, as we discussed, I think that will come in, in course of time. And on the Pradesh government recently they did this by 2024, five years tax rebate. So these, these shops you can consider. So every government, like Karnataka, I did something. I don't think the Bengal government has so far, and Rajasthan government, they have already into it. So these are the state-wise, uh, this, uh, this thing should be done, that uh, there should be some debate. So in order to make a conducive environment. And centers move charging infrastructure at every three, uh, every three kilometers, the last two, three days in economic times, and highways, Every 50 kilometer, there will be charging stations. And MHS big push, they, the cars they use, guzzlers they use, they will be using this EV. So these are the centers move uh, towards this new jamana of EV. So we hope so. That will be a greater day, pollution-free days ahead. So thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Nandi. Um, unfortunately, since we're running so late, we'll have to keep the question and answer session uh, or rather Q&A with the individual panelists after the session is closed. Uh, thank you for your attention. There's one more session coming up before the end of day. Uh, and please join me in thanking the panelists for their uh, point of view. Uh, clearly, there's uh, a lot of work that needs to be done yet. And uh, as uh, um, Dr. Junjunwala said, we'll keep our fingers crossed that the uh, long-term EV policy is, uh, is a positive one and, and comes sooner rather than later. Uh, so thank you, gentlemen, for joining me on the panel, um, and thank you for your attention. Yeah, uh, Mr. Behel, I would request you to hand over the token of appreciation to all the speakers. Thank you, audience, for your patient listening. Please join us for the next session in 10 minutes.